name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. I'm privileged to serve St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, St. Luke's Covington, and Trinity St. John Lutheran School in Nashville, Illinois. Thank you for tuning into the Bible class. Today we'll continue our study of Matthew. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you demonstrated the authority of your word by using it to heal many diseases, to drive out demons, to still the storm, and to teach the truth of God. Speak to us today, Lord Jesus, and grant that your word would have its way with us. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is in vain. and Without your light, our search is useless. Invigorate our study of your holy word, that by due diligence and right discernment, we may be established by your spirit in your holy faith, and be equipped to share it with others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Last week we began Matthew chapter 8 and heard of Jesus cleansing or healing a leper. Jesus touched him and said, Be clean! And it was so. We also heard how Jesus marveled at the faith of a centurion who asked Jesus for healing for his servant. He told Jesus, Only say the word, and my servant will be healed. Jesus said the word, and the man's servant was healed that very moment. Today we have more examples of the authority of Jesus' word. Here is Braden Luking, a senior at Christ the Rock Lutheran High School. In fact, he's graduating this afternoon. He's reading Matthew 8, verses 14 to 17. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirit with a word, and healed all who were sick. This was to fill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our diseases. To begin with, as we talk about it, note that Peter does have a mother-in-law. In other words, he's married. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul defends the right of an apostle to be married, right along with having the right to earn a living through preaching and teaching. There it says, Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? That's Peter's Aramaic name. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? Paul, nevertheless, did give up his rights to draw a salary and to be accompanied by a believing wife. He wanted the joy of presenting the gospel free of charge, and he had the gift to be content as a single person. But later, when he lists the qualifications of a pastor, he will say that they should be the husband of one wife, 1 Timothy 3. And he also says that it is the teaching of demons when people are forbidden to marry, 1 Peter 4. Now, when Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law, there's no need for recuperation or an extended period of time for her to get her strength back. Normally, people need some time to rest, but Jesus' healing is so complete and immediately that right away she is completely well and strong and goes to work to serve them. That's the authority of Jesus' word. She gives us a great example of how it works with the people of God. We are saved, we are healed, we respond by serving others. We love because he first loved us. How will you respond to God's gifts of healing and forgiveness in your life? Matthew shows that he knows the difference between demon possession and ordinary sickness, yet the two are related. Remember, it was the devil's seduction of Adam and Eve in the garden that brought sickness and death and all those bad effects that followed. But not every sickness is a result of direct demonic influence. Christ has removed the sting of sickness and even of death. Without the Lord Jesus Christ and his work, every sickness of body and mind would simply be a precursor of death and a mark of God's anger against the sin that's in us. 
But the Lord Jesus has removed the anger of God toward us by suffering in our place all that our sins deserve. Matthew reminds us that the healing ministry of Jesus fulfilled the prophet's words. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. That's a word from Isaiah 53, the chapter that clearly describes the suffering of the Lord Jesus for our sins on the cross. You see, Jesus, he's the great physician of body and soul, and he's not the type of doctor just to treat the symptoms. No, he goes to the very core of the issue and has treated the root cause of all the sickness and illness that we ever face in a lifetime. That root is our sin. His perfect robe of righteousness covers our sin and guilt. The root cause has been removed by his sacrifice. We're just waiting for all the symptoms to disappear. That'll come on the last day when our bodies will be raised imperishable and incorruptible. Matthew's quotation of that great chapter, Isaiah 53, about the atoning work of Jesus, shows us the close connection between the forgiveness or removal of sins and the healing of diseases. Just as Jesus takes away our sin, he also removes the fever and the leprosy. He does not himself become feverish or leprous, though he does suffer the curse for all sin and guilt when he suffers damnation for us on the cross. So when it says he took our illnesses and bore our diseases, it means he took them away. Recall that already in chapter 1, Matthew told us that Jesus will save his people from their sins. And as Jesus begins his ministry in chapter 4, we see the coming of the reign of God, including preaching, teaching, and, and, and healing. Salvation from sin is rooted in and flows out from the forgiveness of, of that sin. This salvation includes removal not only of the guilt of sin, but also all of the effects of sin. Jesus' ministry has the end of all things in mind. It begins and it anticipates God's complete reigning and restoring on the last day. So Jesus heals and drives back Satan, anticipating the day when he will finally abolish every assault from the devil and all sickness. Jesus will also overcome and undo death itself. Remember, sickness is simply death on the way. And you can see why the doctrine of the resurrection of our bodies on the last day, not just the salvation of our souls, is so important to the Christian message. This is a teaching unique to Christianity. No other religion would dare to teach the resurrection of the body. It only fits for those who trust in Jesus, who himself rose bodily from the grave. All of this points to the end and goal of the book of Matthew, which tells the good news of Jesus. The cross, which comes at the end of the gospel, that's where Jesus dies in the place of sinners. And it's the fulfillment, not only of his predictions that he would suffer, not only the fulfillment of his baptism and his conflict with Satan. His cross and his resurrection are also the fulfillment of his healing ministry. When he heals, Jesus takes away sickness for a time and shows that he's come to undo the power and effects of sin. When he raises the dead, Jesus overcomes for a time in the lives of particular people the power of sin's consequence. But when Jesus dies and rises from death, he does so in our place in order to free all who will follow him from sickness and sin and death. When he casts out demons and he heals, that's cut from the same cloth as his death for us and his resurrection for us. This is the ruling activity of God on behalf of sinners who are plagued by troubles that the Creator never intended. Now all of this reminds me why the church has for centuries sent people, especially pastors, to visit the sick. It is well known that body and soul are wonderfully connected. When the soul is at peace, knowing that we have been forgiven of our sins and that we're right with God, the peace that comes over us lends itself toward the healing of the body. Remember a blessing that we use after giving the Lord's Supper says, The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. 
Now, some might ask, well, if Jesus had the power to heal fevers and other diseases with a word, if the apostles were given that power, why is it today that faithful pastors do not go around rebuking fevers and infections and cancers and tumors and blindness? Well, the answer is that we in the church today operate under the command of Jesus in Matthew 28 to make disciples by baptizing and teaching. That's what Jesus has given us to do until he returns. Now the Lord can and often does give healing in the body in answer to our bold and faithful prayers. But the Lord has not given us charge over diseases as he did the apostles. You know, when we are sick, we pray like the leper earlier in the chapter, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. It all has to do with authority. Jesus here again and again demonstrates his authority so that people would put their trust in him as the Son of God and listen to his word of the kingdom. Called ministers of Christ dare to stand in front of fellow sinners and tell them, I forgive you your sins only because the risen Christ has given them this authority. He commanded them, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. Or remember the time when Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water? Well, if we have faith in the Lord Jesus, shouldn't we be able to do the same thing, to go out on Carlisle Lake, step out of a boat and do the same? Yes, but only if Jesus gave us that authority. How was Peter given the authority to walk on water? It was the word of Christ. Remember, Jesus told him, come, and then Peter got out of the boat. Now, today is Pentecost in the church here, the great festival celebrating the miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is indeed the Lord and giver of life. Here, the fifth and sixth graders of Trinity St. John Lutheran School sing a prayer to the Holy Spirit called Holy Spirit, Light Divine. Holy Spirit, Light Divine, shine. And now here are Bianca Adubato and Ryan Wibbles, graduating seniors from Christ the Rock Lutheran High School, reading Matthew 8, verses 18 to 22. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. When thinking of these two disciples, or would-be disciples, remember that when Jesus gathered his disciples, he called them. He didn't take volunteers. He does the initiating and the work and the life are his. It may be that the first of these two, the scribe, is trusting in his own ability to follow Jesus. Whereas in the second case, Jesus is taking the initiative and says to him, follow me. To the first man, Jesus basically says that he is homeless. 
He's on a journey, on the road, on a mission. It makes him homeless on earth. To journey with him means departing from all that belongs to this world. Unlike foxes and birds, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us lay aside every weight, he says. Are we ready to be homeless with Jesus? That is, to consider our walk with him more important than all the things that make us comfortable? The Son of Man will not exercise his own authority for his own comfort or his own self-promotion. To follow such a one as this man will be to surrender all guarantees of the comfort of a predictably stable existence. Though the humble animals can count on places of rest and welcome, Jesus will not operate a ministry that secures this comfort and stability for himself or for his disciples. Now, verse 20 is the first time Matthew records Jesus using that familiar name for himself, the Son of Man. That phrase, the Son of Man, occurs 30 times just in the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus will use it in all kinds of situations when speaking with non-disciples, with disciples, with the crowds, even with those who are in direct conflict with him. Yet, in all of these groups, Jesus also very often simply refers to himself as I or me. And he uses other titles for himself. So this was not his exclusive name for himself, but one that he often used. And scholars have struggled to figure this out. They determine it's not really a common or widely used title from the Messiah. We probably think of the hymn, Beautiful Savior, where Jesus is called Son of God and Son of Man. The phrase Son of Man does refer to the person, Jesus of Nazareth, who is truly a man. But it doesn't focus on his humanity in contrast to him being God. It's kind of the opposite because many believe it points to Daniel chapter 7, which speaks of divine qualities of the Son of Man. There Daniel reports, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, that would be God the Father, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now many have wondered, did Jesus have this in mind when he called himself the Son of Man? And he certainly knew it, of course, and as we'll go on through Matthew, it seems more and more Jesus has that in mind, and he'll want his hearers to begin to think about that. But I believe Dr. Gibbs is right when he concludes that to many of Jesus' hearers, this name for himself, the Son of Man, was kind of obscure and ambiguous. And maybe that's the very reason Jesus chose to use it. He wanted people to start thinking about this to turn this question over in their minds. Why is Jesus referring to himself this way? Who is he claiming to be? That's Jesus' style of teaching, remember. Instead of coming out and saying something right away, he'll often want you to think about it and turn it over in your mind and come to the conclusion yourself. Now we come to Jesus' encounter with this other disciple. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, don't misunderstand Jesus' words. For one thing, it is certainly not the case that this man's father has just died and they've not yet had the funeral and buried him. In the ancient world, they only let a few hours go by after someone died, one day at the most, before they buried someone. So if that were the case, the man most certainly would have been at home with his family. 
not out listening to Jesus. Nor should we suppose the father was sick unto death and they're just waiting for him to pass. Rather, the man's statement simply says he felt it was his duty to remain at home and care for his parents until both of them were laid to rest peacefully. It might be years. Now, remember also to balance what Jesus says here with his teaching on the commandment, honor your father and mother, which he took very seriously. That'll come up big time in chapter 15 in a dispute with the Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus is saying here that to be fit for proclaiming the kingdom of God, you need to subordinate all family ties and worldly cares and focus on the task at hand. Remember how he said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's in Matthew 10. This commitment will put one at odds with the world and even with members of your own family. Recall that Jesus said, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now, if you're following Christ with your whole heart, you will be blessed if you find that the people closest to you are the people with whom you share this same commitment. When Jesus says, leave the dead to bury their own dead, he's telling us that he and all who follow him as people with citizenship in heaven, people who have been raised to life in holy baptism, are actually distinct from the dead in this world. So it's a matter of the heart that Jesus is speaking about for his disciples. I think of Pastor C.F.W. Schultz, a missionary to Southern Illinois in the 1840s and 50s. One of the reasons he felt comfortable leaving Germany was because he had been orphaned as a child. He had no mother or father who still needed his care. I rejoice that I have six siblings and I was able to come down to Southern Illinois because my mom and dad lived next to one of my siblings, later two in Indiana. And with modern communication and transportation, we're able to keep up ties even if we leave geographically. Let's go on to Matthew 8, 23 to 27. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds in the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? Jesus calming the storm reminds us of the works of God through Moses, who led Israel through the Red Sea, Exodus 14, reminds us of Joshua, who led Israel through the Jordan River into the Promised Land, Joshua 3, Elijah and Elisha, 2 Kings 2. The Jordan River opened up before both of them. We also think of Jonah, who was running away from God when a violent storm came up, Remember, he was sleeping in the hold of the ship and they woke him up. Jonah told them to throw him into the sea in order to make the storm stop. The sailors didn't want to do it, but when they finally did throw him in, the storm stopped immediately. Then Jonah was rescued by that great fish that God prepared to do so. Jonah chapter 1. One of the great themes of the Psalms is that God has power over the chaotic waters. Psalm 29 says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Psalm 65, By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves. Psalm 89, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 104 speaks of the Lord in control at creation and in the flood of Noah's time. It says, He set the earth on its foundations, so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. 
At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. And finally, one more, this from Psalm 107. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people, and praise him by the assembly of the elders. Well, you get the idea. So we know the answer to the question asked by the disciples. What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Why, this can be no other than the Lord God himself in human form. Who else can rebuke the wind and wave and they obey him? Yes, the disciples were in genuine danger. Save us, Lord, we are perishing, they say. They had received God's word with joy, but in the time of testing, they were in danger because of their lack of steadfast endurance. Yet they turn to Jesus for help and he calms their fears along with the wind and the waves. Jesus is certainly a successful rebuker. He rebukes demons and they come out of the demon possessed. He rebukes a fever and it leaves the woman who is sick. Wherever creation has run amok, Jesus can fix it with his powerful word. The word of Jesus, the creator in the flesh, has the power to halt evil and restore creation. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we'll continue our study of the Bible. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. God's blessings to the men at the Centralia Correctional Center. I plan to be there this Thursday for Lutheran worship and study beginning at 8.30 a.m. Hope you can join us. We thank our sponsor and our faithful partners at V1047. And thanks to Dr. Jeffrey Gibbs. Many of his insights and his commentary on Matthew have found their way into this broadcast. And thank you for listening.